how would you describe the state of affairs of this pandemic now that we're almost entering the third year, believe it or not? Right. So first of all, I recognize everyone's tired. I recognize everybody wants to be out of this. I certainly want to be out of this and and I'm with everyone in that. If we sort of look at where we are today, um, Cases are coming down from Omicron. They have been at record highs, but those cases are coming down and they're coming down almost as swiftly as they went up. Um, Certainly if we look at individual cities, we've seen them come down. As a lagging indicator, we have seen hospitalizations high, but those too are starting to come down. And then finally, that our death rates um, are high, um, higher than we had seen in some other peaks. Um, So around 2,300 a day. Um, So that is where we are right now. I certainly don't like to see um, our death counts as high as they are. Those continue to be tragic um, with every single family they they, um, touch. What I can say, though, is over time, we now are mounting more and more immunity in the population, the substrate of the population, as we get more and more people vaccinated, more and more people boosted, and people who are encountering disease who will get some background immunity from that. We have now background immunity, more background immunity in the population. And we also have a lot more tools than we used to. If you think, you know, you say year three in this pandemic, and that's where we are, but um, we also now have vaccines. We We have a menu of therapeutics. We have more testing options. And so we're working now to best utilize those tools in the context of what may lie ahead. You know, I get confused because we keep hearing that the Omicron variant is less lethal. And yet, as you mentioned, 2,300 deaths a day, and that's the highest in nearly a year. So can you just explain how those two ideas can coexist? Yeah, I I think that's a really important question. So milder does not mean mild. And I I think mild can come in two different kinds of ways. For every single person that gets sick, if you were to get sick with Omicron compared to Delta, you might be less likely to end up in the hospital. However, if we have three or four times the number of cases because of how transmissible Omicron is, we still end up with lots of people in the hospital and again, lots of deaths. So it is this interplay between the absolute number of cases that you have and that each case for case may be less lethal, but because we have so many more, we still have challenges both in our hospitals and with our deaths. I know there have been breakthrough cases, but does the vaccine still seem to protect people from severe illness? And can you quantify the percentage of deaths from Omicron among the vaccinated population? Yeah. um, So, here, here's what we know is that because of Omicron, two things have happened. One, you need more protection, more immune protection from Omicron than you have with prior variants. And two, just when Omicron hit, many people who had been previously vaccinated with their primary series were starting to wane in that protection. So people who are more than six months out of their primary series might have protection in the 50, 55% range in terms of severe disease presenting to an emergency department. However, with that booster shot, we can bolster that protection from that 50 to 55 range all the way up to 80 to 90% with that booster shot, which is why right now we're really encouraging people to get boosted. Here's what we know about what's in the hospital. The vast majority of people who are in the hospital continue to be people who are unvaccinated. We're also seeing people who are in the hospital who might've been vaccinated, but either they were vaccinated and not boosted, or they are people who might be less likely to have mounted a really good immune response to the vaccine, people who are older, people who are more immunocompromised. Latest data from the CDC on Friday demonstrated you are 68 times more likely to die from Omicron um, compared if you're unvaccinated compared to if you're boosted. This is a selfish question, but I think a lot of people are probably in my boat. Dr. Walensky, I'm 65. I was boosted. Should I get a, a second booster or a fourth shot? 
Yeah, right now those data are really starting to emerge in terms of waning from your booster dose. Um, certainly we've seen in some countries, Israel for the most part, have been starting to think about and have been boosting their, um, their older populations, their more vulnerable populations. We haven't yet seen a lot of data on the waning protection from boosters in the context of Omicron. And those data are just forthcoming. Right now from the CDC, we are not recommending yet a boost, another booster dose. I know that you say milder doesn't necessarily mean mild. Yet in an open letter to Governor Newsom, four UCSF doctors, including the director of COVID response, are calling on state leaders to acknowledge the transition of COVID to an endemic disease and lift most masking policies for school-aged children. What's your response to that? Um, well, I'll go back to, we all wanna be in a place where we are not living in a crisis situation. In my mind, one of the places we have to look at first is how are our hospitals doing? Um, can our hospitals take care of not just the COVID patients that are in there, but can they manage the routine medical care that should that comes in every single day, our motor vehicle accidents, our, our heart attacks, our strokes, and how are they doing? Because that is one of the indicators, a barometer, if you will, that I look at to say, can we start um, getting back out of this crisis mode? And I would say all of us are looking forward to that and want to sort of get to that place. But in so many parts of the country, we are not there yet. We are still seeing hospital capacities that are overwhelmed and not able to do so. And so that is a place that we all want to be and that we're all aiming for, preparing for, and yet we're not there quite yet. But shouldn't there be certain regulations or recommendations or restrictions depending on the region you're living in and the circumstances that are happening in that area? Absolutely. And in fact, we do at CDC have a map stratified by county, actually, that looks at how every individual county is doing in terms of cases per 100,000. We look at both hospitalizations as well as death counts. And right now, those cases are still across the country um, over every county, nearly every county in the country is red. It is those cases that actually um, help us inform when people can and should be able to take off their masks. Um, and so we do do that at the jurisdictional level, because as you know, very much um, many of these is we're a very big country. We're uneven with regard to how our cases are, how our vaccination rates are, um, how our hospitals are doing. But right now I will remind people, you know, Omicron hit us with a lot of cases. And so right now we're not quite ready to do that. I'm almost afraid to ask this, but an Omicron subvariant, BA2, has already been found in nearly 50 countries. So what do we know about this variant? How concerned should we be? Right, really important question. So BA2 is what they call a sublineage, a sister of um, BA1, which is the most prominent um, Omicron sublineage we have. So most of what we have here in the United States, over 99.5% of Omicron is Omicron. And the large majority of that, the vast majority of that is the BA1 sublineage. Um, now we started to detect this BA2 sublineage. We have seen it in some areas um, in Denmark and in, um, in the UK, well, Denmark and, and India, where it's become more dominant. In the UK, it's still less than 1%. We're starting to learn more and more about it. We haven't yet seen any more severe disease from it. And it does look like our current vaccines will work about as well as they did as they do against the Omicron itself. It might be a little bit more transmissible, which may be the reason we're seeing more and more of it in certain countries. Here in the United States, we've detected it. We've actually known about it here in the United States since mid-December. Um, we haven't yet seen it ratchet up in terms of seeing more and more of it. We have a handful of cases here and we're continuing to follow it very carefully. So this one doesn't seem to be of grave concern. I mean, how worried are you, Dr. Walensky, every day you're going to hear about a much more serious variant? I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, but are we going to have to be on a constant state of alert that that an even deadlier variant may be right around the corner? 
So that is our job is to be on a constant state of alert. That's our job at CDC. But really, I think the important thing is to be alert and prepared and not yet necessarily to panic, right? Because we know that our vaccines right now, it looks like are working against Omicron, not quite as well as they did against, um, against Delta, but they are working well, especially if you get boosted. And our job is to follow these variants. We do know as long as we have circulating virus, we have the potential for variants. But what the long-term goal is, is to be able to manage these variants and to not have a crisis every time we have a variant, but to be able to live in the context of the potential variants that might emerge. And that means that our testing is working, our therapeutics are working, and our vaccines are continually working and up to date. So will this be the new normal, something we just live with and manage with annual shots that hopefully can combat whatever strain comes along? Um, I don't want to pretend that I'm content with where we are right now as being a new normal. We are coming down from a pretty robust surge. And so that I don't think is a new normal place. I envision a new normal place um, where our hospitals can manage, where our workforce is back, um, where we might have to combat many surges, um, but that we have the tools, the tests, the therapeutics, the vaccines that work. Jury is still out as to whether and how often we will need to have those vaccines. It may be that we need them annually. It may be just like you roll up your sleeve for your flu shot every year. You roll up your sleeve for your COVID shot every year. And we still have more science to learn from in order to see if that's where we're going to be. Even if it's endemic, it could still be quite dangerous. Yeah, um, what I would say is I would like to be in a place where we are endemic at relatively low rates of disease, where we have low rates of disease, high rates of vaccination, high rates of protection, and certainly low level of death. I also want to remind people that even with the vaccination, even for those um even with vaccination, we have the capacity now, we have new therapeutics and, and even more science that continues to evolve. And some of those therapeutics can also, as I say, take the fangs out of this and really lead to less severe disease. So we have a lot of tools in the toolbox and working now to scale those up to make sure that everyone has access to them. Children under five still aren't able to get the vaccine, as you know, and I get this question constantly on social media. When will we see that approved? And are you, does that give you pause at all, the idea of vaccinating children under five? Um, you know, the, the uh, companies are working towards a timeline for children under five. I can't tell you exactly when that will be with a date certain, and I know parents are really anxious. Um, when it happens through the FDA process, through the CDC process, I can tell you um, it won't happen with me at the helm at CDC unless all of that due diligence is done such that I would be comfortable vaccinating any child that I would have that's under the age of five. So that I can, uh, that I can say. Um, what I can say is we really need to work to vaccinate all those who are around our children under five because we have seen time and time time again, that in households where you have two and three people vaccinated, you surround them, you, you cocoon children under five, um, that they are less likely to get disease. And right now, you know, we have about 52% of our teenagers who have received their primary series, about 20% of our children between the ages of five to 11. So we have a lot of work to do and I would encourage parents to get their children who are eligible vaccinated so that we can really protect those who aren't eligible yet. A lot of people on social media also wanted me to ask you about the troubling cases of long COVID. Is the CDC collecting data on this? Many of those folks feel that they've been sort of abandoned by the medical establishment. Yeah, so we have a lot of studies that are ongoing at CDC, both at surveillance level, as well as um, through electronic health records. NIH actually has quite a bit of funding to look at the manifestations and disease of long COVID and to try and understand how we intervene with long COVID. So there are many resources. The one thing I do want to say here, and I think it's really important, is that, um, you know, 
COVID hit um, disproportionately across the United States. And we've seen that. We've seen that in more vulnerable populations. We've seen that in racial and ethnic minority communities. And um, because of that, that will have implications on who gets long COVID. And so I think we have a responsibility to make sure that those patients who were hardest hit by the original wave of um, waves of COVID-19, that we work to, to provide them resources, access to medical care um, for those who have received long, who have long COVID. Um, we don't have a lot of data yet on Omicron and long COVID um, because we cert it just certainly hasn't been with us enough, but we're talking to our international community, those who have um, had COVID before us, South Africa, UK, uh, Omicron before us, South Africa and UK, so that we can have sort of a, an earlier window as to what's happening there. And then we, of course, will continue those studies here. I know this is a politically charged question, but it's still unclear how this virus started. No animal host has been found. And there are many critics who believe that this could have come from a lab in Wuhan and it's somehow being covered up. What's your response to that? Um, you, I think it's an important question. Um, we may not be able to get to the bottom of that question. What I can say is that we have known many prior coronavirus, and I don't have insight into the truth behind that question. I think it, it would be helpful historically and scientifically to know and understand it. I think we should do everything we can scientifically to understand it. I also know that historically coronaviruses, whether they be SARS or MERS, um, have traditionally come from an animal zoonotic source. So we have history that suggests that the capacity to jump, um, but that is not just definitive for this virus. So you wouldn't rule out the possibility that it I haven't had enough window into the science to, to be able to say, and I don't know that we will ever be able to discern it tragically. It's been baptism by fire for you. Welcome to the world of being a public figure, Dr. Walensky. And there's been a lot of criticism of the CDC's public messaging. Looking back, uh, what would you have done differently or what do you think the missteps might have been? Yeah, I think a lot about this. Um, first, let me say, um, I, I came out and said I was going to lead with the science and that is what I have done. And it has been my North Star. I, I came from the bedside um, when I joined the CDC and it is you know, the patients, every single one of them as individuals and collectively in public health that um, drive how I make decisions. Um, that science during a pandemic is fast moving. And sometimes that science is gray and you have to make decisions when you don't have all the perfect science that you would like because the situation itself is imperfect. I think given the curveballs that we've seen through this pandemic, much of what I might have done differently is to say for now, or um, this could change, or you know, there, there's much that we are continuing to learn because we have had to update our science as we've learned as and our guidance as we've learned new science. Um, and so much of that would have been actually we need to continue to be humble as we learn more and more. A lot of people watching this or listening to this are thinking, okay, I mean, you hear about COVID fatigue everywhere, Dr. Walensky. I know you don't have a crystal ball, but when you look at the data that you currently have, when you hear Dr. Fauci say this will peak in mid-February, when realistically do you think we might be able to get back to normal? Um, so let me tell you what I think normal looks like. And that is, we talked a little bit about this, our hospitals can manage patients coming in. Um, we are in a place where we can start enjoying uh, activities that we once knew and loved. Um, I know everybody's interested in taking off their masks. And what I would say is we should manage the expectations that on you know, any given date certain that we'll be back to normal, because I think we're going to tiptoe towards normal um, and we'll increasingly over time um, 
providing that there is not another uh, variant that throws us a curveball, increasingly over time, be able to um, start peeling back all of those layers of, of protection that we have had. Um, but I don't think that, I think we should manage the expectation that on any given date, we will be there. I know that you believe this public health crisis has really uh, shown a spotlight on the deficiencies in our public health system and how we need to bolster it. What do you think needs to be done so we're better prepared for the next, I don't wanna say this, but the next public health crisis, whatever that might be? Thank you for asking that question because we have so much work to do. So over the last decade, um, we have had H1N1, Ebola, Zika, and now COVID. And over that last decade, there's an anticipation that we're now 80,000 people in deficit in our public health workforce. So not only do we need the sheer volume and the number of people, but we need to scale up our workforce, upskill our workforce so that we have in any given community, community health workers and genomic epidemiologists. So we have a lot of work to do in scaling up the skill um, and, and sheer volume of people. Public health has to be an attractive place to enter. It's an incredible career. Um, it's, it's very other oriented and, and it's just incredible what you can do in public health. Our data systems have been frail. They have been untended to. Um, we need to be able to have the pipes connect so that data from one state can easily communicate with data from another that all can come together at CDC so we can compare different trends so that as you say, our region that's running into a challenge, we would be able to see um, quickly. And then we need to scale up our lab capacity, our laboratory capacity at every different, at every different jurisdiction and state so that we have immediate capacity to detect challenges locally where they are. We have a lot of work to do in our public health workforce and in our public health infrastructure. And that's what I'm really trying and working and committed to be able to do um, as we're, we're sort of shining a light on where our deficiencies were coming in. It must be heartening for you to hear that, that applicant applications to medical schools have skyrocketed as a result of this pandemic or increased dramatically. I don't know if skyrocketing is hyperbolic, but it must be heartening to you that many more people are at least applying to medical school, which is good, Is but some of those people need to go into public health when they graduate. <laughs> Well, and I was one of them. So, um, <laughs> so I do, there is an incredible pathway through medicine to public health. There's an incredible pathway through schools of public health and really so many different pathways. And yes, it's really encouraging. I, I love talking to young people who wanna, who wanna um, have taken this moment really of this pandemic and said, actually, this is what I wanna do now. They were moved by this moment. I was moved in my career by the moment of the HIV epidemic that was, that was mo motivating so many of us to enter medicine at the time. And so um, take this moment um, and, and uh, work towards taking that incredible talent of these applicants and moving them towards public health. Dr. Rochelle Walensky. Dr. Walensky, it's really great to talk to you. Thank you so much for doing this, this interview. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.